Welcome to the Migraine Miracle Moment. I'm your host, Dr. Josh Turknett. I'm a neurologist, migraine specialist, migraine sufferer, and author of the book, The Migraine Miracle. In this podcast, you'll learn all about how to find your path to migraine freedom without pills. Let's get started. Howdy, Bee Slayers. Welcome again to the Migraine Miracle Moment. In today's episode, I'm going to share with you an excerpt from a recent clinic chat live uh, that we did on the topic of histamine and histamine intolerance. So this is a topic that uh, I think many people with migraines are at least somewhat familiar with, uh, even if they've just heard the term. And there may be some of you listening who haven't heard about it at all. But histamine intolerance is one of those topics that has really taken off in the internet age. So not surprisingly, there's lots of mythology and misconceptions around it. And the goal with this workshop, as with the others that we do, is to try to find the signal in the noise. And while there is most definitely information out there on histamine intolerance that will lead you astray, um, I do think it is something that those with migraines should know about, which is why I decided to do a dedicated workshop on it. So again, um, this workshop is part of the clinic chat live sessions that we do regularly with our Migraine Everland members. And we typically alternate between general question and answer sessions along with these kind of topic focused workshops. Some of the other topical workshops that we've done include um, key nutrients for migraine protection, uh, five keys to breaking rebound, um, what you need to know about exercise and migraines, gut health for those with migraines, and the replay videos for all of these live sessions, um, including the remainder of this talk on histamine intolerance, is available uh, inside of Migraine Neverland. And if you'd like to learn more about becoming a member and earning your black belt in beast slaying, then head over to MyMigraineMiracle.com and click on the Resources tab. All right, and now on to the excerpt from the workshop on histamine intolerance. All right, so the uh, mission of today is to talk about the connections between histamine and migraine. And it's an issue that I've received a number of questions about over the years. Uh, a lot of folks in Migraine Everland, we've had some discussions around it in clinic chats, um, but I, I felt it was time to, to put it into a one cohesive uh, talk. So, and if you've been on migraine forums before, uh, or in the migraine community, you probably, there's a, at least a decent chance you've heard people talking about histamine intolerance and its relationship to migraines. And it's one of those areas that's really taken on uh, a life of its own in the internet age, for better or for worse. So for better in the fact that it can help raise awareness about certain issues that people might not otherwise be exposed to by their uh, regular doctors. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, that almost always guarantees that you're going to get um, a pretty big dose of misinformation that can sometimes do more harm than good. So I'll see if we can uh, try to separate fact from fiction here. So um, the main questions that we're going to talk about here is what is histamine and then what is histamine intolerance and put that in quotes for reasons that will become clear later. Um, what is its relationship to migraines, if any? And then how can we intelligently integrate information on this topic into a holistic program of migra migraine protection, aka the Migraine Miracle Program? So what, uh, one of uh, the main reasons that I've been somewhat reluctant to talk about this issue too much in the past um, is because it's easy for a topic like this to kind of reinforce what I call smoking gun and silver bullet thinking. Uh, so kind of a, pro a product of our reductionist approach to health and kind of seeing things like molecules and cellular interactions as the most sort of privileged or important types of knowledge and information. Um, and this is kind of the antithesis of a holistic approach that I advocate and that I think is the key to slaying the beast once and for all. Um, and so what happens often is that this issue is talked about, you know, as if it could be 
a sole cause of someone's migraines as if, as in like you have migraines, it might be because uh, you have histamine intolerance. So in other words, this might be the smoking gun you've been looking for all this time. And so it kind of reinforces to people that, you know, your mission as someone with migraines is to find that one thing that's causing your problems. Uh, and of course, the, the issue there is that, as you probably well know by now, is that migraines are never from any one thing. Um, they're not like an infection by a microorganism or a broken bone where there is one cause. They are rather the combined impact of gr a great many things and an extraordinarily complex mix of factors that leads to them. And so the power really of a holistic approach is in the implementation of many different things whose power in slaying the bees also comes from their combined effects and not from the impact of any single thing by on its own. And so, you know, as I've said before, whether we're talking about the things that help or the things that hurt, it's never any one thing and it's always all the things acting in combination. Um, so what we don't want to do is, in, which I've talk, talked about in the um, session on habits and habit stacking is kind of go on the the merry-go-round of uh silver bullets you know first trying a low histamine diet see if that works if it doesn't abandon that maybe try keto see if that works if not abandon that then try botox see if that works and on and on and on and never never getting the effect of combining anything together um and again it gets back to the differences between a holistic and a reductionist approach or mindset when it comes to health so that's why i put those things about those differences between those mindsets at the start of the book keto for migraine and at the, in the beast Slayer training academy um all right so and, and the reason being i want everyone to be able to reap the full benefits of this pr approach in this program so now that I've got that disclaimer out of the way, we can dive in to this topic. Um, so as I said, uh, there um, the vast majority of people who are aware of histamine intolerance these days are probably aware of it because of the internet. Um, not something, not because they read it in a scientific journal or in a textbook or in a class, but rather, you know, in a on a blog post or on Facebook or something like that. And so there's a good amount of misinformation out there. Um, and that's part of why it hasn't gained much traction inside of the medical community. So the issue there is that uh, people will come in to see their doctors, attri attributing all sorts of things to histamine intolerance, and that leads to doctors thinking that it must be some phony illness that people are making up or that's just been invented by the internet. Um, so, and another issue is because it lacks kind of a strong operational definition and the way it's been talked about is kind of um, a little vague and uh, and sort of oh, changing, it means different things to different people. So one person's idea of what histamine intolerance is may be a little different than another. So that creates confusion as well. But by the same token, there are probably a lot of people out there with symptoms and health issues that are related to histamine and having uh, where, where having this knowledge would be helpful that are entirely unaware of it. So you have the issue of, you know, a lot of false positives out there, a lot of people attributing things to histamine that probably aren't from that. And then also a lot of false negatives, if you will, where people are unaware of certain issues uh, that are actually being at least contributed to by histamine or issues with histamine sensitivity. So um, there's definitely a there there. Um, definitely a real thing, but you still may have a hard time convincing some um, doctors about that. So let's get clear then on what we're talking about. And we'll start just by talking about histamine itself. Um, so um, most people are familiar with the word because of antihistamines, uh, medications that are typically prescribed for allergies. Uh, the other uh, common area they're prescribed is for gastric reflux. Um, and they're prescribed for allergies because they are, uh, one of the roles of histamine is they're released by a particular kind of white blood cell, and then that leads to an inflammatory response that's part of allergies. So swelling and redness and inflammation and itching and so forth. Um, but it has a lot of other roles as well. Um, so we, we know of at least four different receptors for histamine, the molecule histamine. Um, 
and the receptors are kind of what det determines its act biological action in the body. So some of the things we know that it's involved with are wakefulness, um, le learning, uh, memory, appetite, uh, neurotransmitter regulation, and of course, as I mentioned before, um, inflammation and immune system response. And so this is why taking an antihistamine where you block some of these things can cause things like drowsiness. So if you're impairing wakefulness, it can cause you to be drowsy. Um, it can impair learning and memory because histamine is involved in that circuitry. Um, it can lead to weight gain through its influence over appetite. And also, it can cause things we probably have no idea about. Um, so again, this is uh, like so many other things in biology, especially when we're talking about the level of cells and molecules, um, we are still learning about what these things do. Um, the, the last histamine receptor to be identified was the H4 receptor. So they're pretty much numbered in order they've, in which they've been identified. And that was around the turn of the century. So there may well be more. Um, and so just as with so many other molecules and receptors and the drugs that impact them, we have no idea of the full range of effects of, of uh, histamine or with the effects of blocking its function. Um, just as an aside about the topic of, of medications and, and interfering kind of at this level of our biology, you know, it's, it's important, I think, to always remember that anytime we take a drug like this, um, whether it's an antihistamine or something else that's that's interfering with a particular uh, receptor or molecule, we're essentially deliberately interfering with our body's normal functioning. We're saying what you're doing, we believe, is not the right thing, and so we know better, and we're going to override override that decision. Um, but we're doing so typically in a very um, rudimentary and imprecise kind of way. So we monkey with our source code at our own risk, and um, should only be a last resort. Um, also add that, so one of the, I mentioned here that, that antihistamines can impair learning and memory, and that um, effect becomes significantly more pronounced the older you are. So, uh, you know, one of the things that we as neurologists do anytime we see someone for an evaluation of cognitive decline or dementia is first look at their medication list. Um, and I've probably been seen as a hero or a miracle worker more often for just taking people off of certain drugs that were uh, unnecessary and, and causing a particular issue because the impact can be so dramatic. Um, more for that than anything else that I've done over the course of my career. Um, and one of those has been antihistamines for someone who is, you know, uh, who is older and having memory uh, issues. And typically the scenario is they've been taking it for, you know, who knows how long to help them sleep at night or whatever. Okay, so the main reason that we care about histamine is because it can cause certain issues with, if we have too much of it in our system. So excess histamine can lead to uh, symptoms, similar symptoms in anyone. So a anyone can have a histamine reaction. Um, the difference is being kind of what it takes to get there, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but, and it's most often talked about in the context of ingesting something or eating something that then leads to excessive amounts of histamine and these types of symptoms. And usually, or those are going to occur within two hours of eating or ingesting something. And a range of symptoms can occur, um, one or more in combination. So, uh, you know, abdominal pain, diarrhea, so GI symptoms, um, a headache, um, typically uh, different than migraine in character. We'll talk a little bit about um, that distinction in a minute. Um, itchy eyes, so things like an allergic type reaction, uh, flushing of the face, um, a cough or asthma, um, menstrual cramping, uh, rapid heart rate. Um, changes in blood pressure, which can either be going down or up, uh, and cause a feeling of fatigue. And again, these usually come on fairly abruptly um, and fairly soon uh, after you've ingested the offending agent, though the degree um, or the intensity of these symptoms may vary. And that's going to be dependent on sort of the amount that's built up. There's another condition uh, that's at least partly secondary to excess histamine called scombroid. 
I mean, people may have heard of it. Sometimes it's called scombroid poisoning. Um, and it is specifically from consuming fish, uh, fish that has not been stored properly. Um, so not fresh and then left out for some period of time. Um, that reaction, usually as the onset is even quicker, 10 minutes to an hour after ingesting it. And it has some very specific symptoms like numbness around the mouth, um, a metallic or a peppery taste, along with headaches and dizziness and palpitations. And um, we actually think that Jenny had this uh, maybe a couple months ago now uh, after some eating some salmon, uh, had some extremely strange reactions that happened quickly. Uh, and then uh, it was later in research that we were like, I think that this is what happened to you. Um, so something to to be mindful of that that's something that can uh, happen um, after uh, fish and then uh, rarely um, anaphylaxis and that's an immediate anaphylactic type of reaction in someone who is has an allergy um so there have been uh, multiple studies that have tried to explore a link between histamine and migraines by Having, pe having people either uh, who are given a, either an infusion of histamine or inhale it. And what those have found primarily is that histamine can provoke both an immediate and a delayed headache. And you can, um, you can block that uh, in these folks if you give them an antihistamine prior to the histamine infusion. Um, the headaches are different in character and only the delayed headache, which happens after the initial histamine reaction has passed with the other symptoms that I talked about, it's the delayed headache that meets the criteria for migraine and those in which it occurs. Um, and both of these kinds of headaches, but in particular the delayed headache, is more common to occur after a histamine infusion in someone who has a history of migraines. So there's evidence that there's a connection between excess histamine and a potential to, to, for that to lead to migraine. Uh, and it appears that that happens indirectly, um, meaning not through the direct action of histamine, uh, but probably through secondary effects. Uh, so we know that it leads to release of stress hormones as one of the things that happens after you um, have excess histamine in the system. So it's probably kind of a chain reaction that then leads to a provocation of migraines in this particular setting, at least, where it's occurring after an infusion. Um, incidentally, you can do this the same, you see the same sort of thing uh, with drugs that promote re the release of nitric oxide. So it will also cause the same type of immediate and then delayed headaches. Uh, only in that case, that one's not blocked by um, antihistamine. So illustrating the fact that there are many roads that leads to lead to the beast. And also it's important to note that these studies aren't reflecting what's happening in real life since there's no instance in real life where you're going to be inject, inject, ingesting pure histamine uh, in this way. Um, so again, it's only going to be one piece in the migraine story. And part of that is evidenced by the fact that studies of antihistamines, which you might, you know, reasonably think if you're, if, if we think histamine might be playing a role in migraine production, then taking an antihistamine may be beneficial. There have been some studies on that, um, some showing some marginal improvement, some not. So not uh, a whole lot of robust evidence for a role of, or that, that antihistamines can uh, prevent uh, migraines. Uh, it's still possible. It's per perhaps, you know, in a select uh, population, maybe, um, but right now it's not something that's recommended. Um, and it's also uh, to add further complexity is the fact that there is a study showing regular histamines inf histamine infusions uh, to be helpful for migraine prevention. And the hypothesis uh, there was that histamine is acting uh, is acting through the H3 receptors, which on mast cells, which the, actually those particular receptors, when they bind to histamine, prevent the release of histamine from those cells. And perhaps that that's helping to reduce the amount of um, neurogenic inflammation in the brain. Um, again, that's just a speculation of why giving somebody his histamine could actually prevent, help prevent migraine. Now, the um, the effect wasn't tremendous in that study, but still interesting nonetheless. Um, and the 
truth of the matter is we don't really have any idea again um, why that's helpful and we don't really understand any of this stuff um, anywhere near enough to be able to explain these complex biological phenomena like migraines in terms of cellular and molecular interactions, um, even though people try to do that sort of thing all the time. Um, we we don't have uh, nearly enough knowledge to do so, and then we also uh, don't know how to predict all these, uh, how all these um, things interact with each other. So I think at this point, the thing we can say with a reasonable degree of, co of confidence is that histamine, specifically excess histamine, contributes to migraines in some people. So it is a factor worth knowing um, and something to be mindful of. And the, it can contribute either from consuming an excess of it uh, or being sensitive to it or both. So one of the points of confusion i think around this issue is that it's oftentimes discussed as an either or thing like you either are histamine intolerant or you're not or you have histamine intolerance like it's this condition and the truth is everybody lies on a spectrum so there are degrees of tolerance to histamine and really by tolerance i mean what level of histamine in the body will trigger a reaction to it rather than people being tolerant or intolerant, right? History is a naturally occurring um, molecule. So of course we have, all, all of us have it floating around and it's not causing um, symptoms than, uh, in those who are diagnosed with histamine intolerance. So it's not an either or situation. It's not a, uh, it's a false dichotomy to talk about it like that. Um, it's, it's very much analogous to the situation with migraines where every brain can generate a migraine. The difference is in the threshold for what it takes to generate that reaction uh, from one brain or one person to the next. So again, we can think of our tolerance to histamine lying along a spectrum. Um, and uh, another, another point of confusion is that this tolerance is fixed uh, in, a, in a given person, and, it's, and that's not at all the case either. So your own personal tolerance or this little slider that you can move to the left or right um, varies even over the course of the day. Uh, thanks to all sorts of factors. And you can also significantly modify your tolerance over time as well, um, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, one other factor that influences your tolerance is gender. So um, women are more likely to be less tolerant of histamine than men. Um, and it's been shown that the effects of histamine are amplified by estrogen. So it's thought that that's why that's what accounts for this gender difference. Um, so in other words, it takes less histamine to produce a reaction if there's estrogen in the system. And this particular phenomenon appears to be at least partly involved in generating symptoms like hot flashes and menstrual migra mi migraines and menstrual cramps. And incidentally, um, pregnancy tends to help uh, with histamine uh, symptoms, likely because the placenta produces lots of a uh, molecule called DAO, or diamine oxidase, uh, which is the enzyme that breaks down histamine. And it does that to help protect the baby from its effects. So DAO is what breaks down uh, histamine in the bloodstream. And uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. So as I said, there are multiple factors that determine your histamine threshold or how much you can tolerate uh, in how much you can ingest before you'd have symptoms. Okay, so now let's talk about the things in the diet that will tend to raise histamine levels. So um, again, your tolerance kind of determines how much of this it would take before you might have a reaction. All right, thanks so much for listening to this episode of The Miracle Moment. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to the podcast in your podcast player of choice. And if you know any fellow migraine sufferers, please feel free to share it with them as well. And now it's time to go out and slay the beast. Mm -hmm.